Which which should be okay. So yeah. here we have uh, better you know infrastructure. They have very very specific what to import and what will be liable to tax. Okay, webinar is starting. Yeah, we can start, sir. So if you can unmute yourself, sir. Can you hear, sir? I think you must be shifting to laptop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and tourism sector, for example, like uh, they are actually very much worried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now it's okay. So can you hear us? You have to unmute yourself, sir. He's muted, yes. Sir, so, requesting you to kindly unmute yourself, sir. Yep, yep. Good morning, sir. Can you hear Very us? good morning. Very good morning, sir. Sir, we have uh, uh, Mr. Nisit Parekh and Mr. Saket uh, Patwari from Nextime SKP, and uh, they are expert in the field. And uh, today, like, uh, we are all here uh, to discuss the budget analyze it from the services perspective. And without say, uh, saying anything else, because they are the experts in their own field. And I would like to introduce our chairman here. Uh, he's a, and, uh, he's a CA by profession and past president of ICAI. And a lot of uh, you know, uh, accomplishments on his, in his journey, uh, an expert in this area. So I would uh, request our chairman, sir, to kindly uh, start the proceeding with the welcome address, sir. Thank you so much and very good morning to all of you. It's indeed a great pleasure to see you both are there, one from Charter Accountant and Mr. Saket. We are extremely thankful for having agreed to give your views to our members of SAPC. And as a Chartered Accountant, I would say yes, every year Chartered Accountants are waiting eagerly to see what are the amendments in direct tax. What are the tax reliefs? What are the tax incentives? And since two years, we are seeing that budget is not fully focusing on direct and indirect tax, but it's overall macroeconomy, how the country can progress, how the growth of the GDP can be increased, and how overall there is a boost in the economy. Those are the steps taken. And that is why even in this year, we don't see any changes in the tax step. And that's the right measure. Because I was looking at the statistics which was given by uh, the finance secretary that if the limit would have been raised to 5 lakh rupees, almost half of the taxpayer would have been out of the slab of the income tax. Out of 6 crore taxpayers, more than 60% of the people are filing the return of income below 5 lakhs. So that's a huge impact. And that's the wise decision that government is keeping them in the net of income tax so that sooner or later they can be checked, verified, and if they are evading the tax, they can be brought to pay a higher tax and penalty. Because what I feel, in my view personal, since I'm telling this last three years, that India has a potential of at least 10 crore SSEs who should file the return, who are having a taxable income, but one or somehow they are not filing, they are not honest, and they are not coming in the camera or net of the department. And that's what department is now increasing. They are trying to see that they are in the net of department by way of larger provisions in TDS, tax deducted at source. And the moment TDS is deducted, there is a mechanism available to the department to find out the person and in turn see what is his real income if he comes to claim the refund of TDS. So that's a very good news. For manufacturing, yes, there are good benefits. For MSME, there are good benefits given in this budget. A lot of money are being spent for farmers and poor. And that is the reason that, yes, all over we can see that there is a positive growth in the business and industry. Almost every industry is now making very good profit, be it chemical, textiles, pharma, steel, infrastructure, all are doing ex exceedingly good. And the jump in the contribution of direct tax is more by corporate sectors rather than by individuals. So that's one point we have to keep in mind. But now coming to GST and service tax, yes, we were disappointed. 
to both the speakers, I am telling you very honestly. Not that something was expected in the budget, but there are dire requirement and need to see that government focus to increase the further export of services from India. Services really contribute 55% in GDP and contributes 37% of the total export. And 55,000 crore rupees were given uh, last year as PLI to uh, various uh, manufacturers for production linked incentives. We say that even if you give us 10%, that is 5,500 crore, we are happy, but not a mention or not a whisper on that. So my humble request to both the speaker is yes, how to convince our members of SEPC and other service exporter, both 12 champion services, as well as others, that notwithstanding the incentives like SEIS, how would you try further and put efforts to increase your export? Because ultimately it would add to your income. And secondly, what should we represent or what should be our demand from SEPC to the government with regard to giving incentive, how it affects microeconomic of the ex service exporter, that if incentives are given, there are direct benefits available, more incentives are available and there will be larger export, whether we are right in that approach or analysis or not. So this is one of the major area where all service exporter particularly tourism, medical, education, if not accounting and auditing our profession, they are really very badly affected and they need something from the government. So I would urge you all, you both the speakers to kindly see what best can be even now demanded from GST council or from the concern ministry. Otherwise we are here to have your views and your opinion. So I won't take further time. I once again, thank you so much on my behalf, on behalf of SAPC, for having agreed to address us and sparing your valuable time. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Such a uh, comprehensive view, bird's eye view on the budget and highlighting the gaps, as well as the important uh, significant aspects taken into account. And uh, with these words, like I would request our experts, Mr. Nasif Parikh and Mr. Saket Parikh uh, Patwariji, and experts in their field, direct access and indirect access, to focus on the areas of what uh, Sir just mentioned, and also uh, your perspective from the view, you know, how exporting community in the services sector can be directly benefited or indirectly uh, spill over, as you mentioned in the morning, uh, for the benefits of the industry. So with these words, I leave the floor to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, a warm welcome to all the people who have joined today morning. Uh, good morning, and I would be taking you to the direct tax proposal, and then my colleague uh, Saket would be taking you through the direct tax proposals in the budget. So, like uh, uh, Sunil ji mentioned, that not much has been done for the service industry, uh, but some measures have been done for the manufacturing uh, industry, which may have some bit of spillover effect on the service industry. So if you look at uh, very broadly, the capex has been increased by the government. The capex spending has been increased to 7.5 trillion, which roughly works out to 2.9% of the GDP projected for 22-23. Uh, fiscal deficit uh, projected at 6.9% and 6.4% is something targeted for the next year and overall looking at 25 to uh, 25 26 to reduce it to 4.5 percent and growth levels are above the gdp levels are above uh, the pre-pandemic level and the projection is of 8 to 8.5 percent for next year uh, on the key policy announcements which were made uh, pli scheme for solar capacity installation has been announced whereby around 280 gigawatts of capacity would be built by 2030 one important change was on revamping of the SEZ Act. So now government, which was SEZ, which was a central act, now government is saying that we will replace this law, where we will, whereby we will invite the states to be partners in this and create a new law, which would help uh, building a better infrastructure for companies. And here, SEZ itself would mean 
uh, advantage for service industry because SZ law, we will have to see how it comes out, but it is a special, a special economic zone from where export of service have currently benefits under indirect tax. Uh, obviously, the direct tax benefits were done away with, with the reduction of corporate tax rate. But it would be interesting to see what kind of benefits the new law brings in for the uh, exporters of services as well as for the goods. And one of the biggest change or biggest announcement I would say is on accelerated corporate exit. So today I know the pain because many of my foreign clients or Indian clients who are exiting from India have to undergo a process, a rigorous process of getting multiple approvals, even to close down a company. Government has said that they are going to trim down the period from two years to six months. And if this really happens, it would be a step towards ease of doing business because ease of doing business does not mean at the time of entry, I have smooth entry. Exit also has to be smooth for investors to relook at India and to have a good image for the country as well. Cross-border insolvency law would be introduced. Uh, government's thrust is that to encourage use of blockchain technology. That's where, again, that services angle comes into picture. We are going to use blockchain uh, technology and create digital rupee, which would be a kind of a currency, uh, digital currency for RBI, which would help RBI in cheaper management of uh, currency. Currently, the cost of printing is very high. Hello. Uh, uh, request others to mute their microphone. Uh, promotion of Atma Nirbharta in defense. So more than 68% of CAPEX purchases government is planning to do locally for defense sector. Uh, battery swapping for EVs. Government understands and appreciates that there could be space uh, constraints in urban cities to have full-fledged charging session uh, and hence the battery swapping policy has been introduced. And lastly, passport would become digital soon and that would be another move which would help in terms of reducing the paper work which we have to go through today. Uh, coming on to the direct tax proposal, as I mentioned or as everybody was expecting, there were a lot of expectation on changes on the individual taxation front in terms of giving some benefit either on the slab rate or on ATC limits or on uh, some of the allowances for work from home, but nothing has come, no changes on the tax rate for individuals. Cooperative uh, societies, um, MAT, that is alternate minimum tax has, and surcharge has been aligned with what is there for corporates. Uh, one of the big move and one of the big message which government gave to HNIs was that we are not a pro poor or against rich people. They have reduced surcharge or restricted the surcharge to 15% for all long-term capital gains on any asset. So today, a promoter selling an unlisted shares earlier was uh, paying 28.5% tax. Now he will pay only 23.92% tax, which is around 4.5% saving. And this is not applicable only to shares. Even someone selling a property who is in highest tax bracket was earlier paying 28.5% tax. Now he will pay only 23.92% tax. So a good move to show that we want to treat an asset class at same level uh, and at same benefit because earlier uh, listed equities had this benefit but unlisted did not. So to bring parity, this move has been made. Uh, then there was a circular issued by government a few months back whereby they had said that a certain COVID related expense relief would be given. Those uh, has now been codified in the law, whereby now if you receive any reimbursement from your employer or anybody for your treatment for COVID or for your family members would not be taxable. And also if you receive any money from your employer or anybody else in, on account of death of someone uh, in your family due to COVID, then if you receive it from your employer, it is not taxable without any limits. And if you receive from somebody unrelated, then 10 lakh is the limit. And there are conditions of receiving that amount in 12 months. Again, on corporate tax side, no changes uh, on the tax rates, which is a good thing because two years we suffered in pandemic and there was some murmur that some kind of tax or cess would come in to cover expenses for COVID, but luckily no taxes for corporate, no increase in taxes. Uh, one, one change which came, which is 
slightly negative for indian corporates who are having subsidy subsid subsidies overseas was government in order to promote that foreign exchange comes into india had provided a 15% tax rate on dividend received by indian companies from its foreign subsidiary that provision has been done away with uh, so from 1st april 2022 if you are receiving any dividend from your foreign subsidiary it will be taxed at the normal corporate tax rate which is applicable to your company and not at 15% hopefully uh, there is a window available till 31st march if any company has subsidiaries and has accumulated reserve and they would like to take advantage of this 15% then they should declare that dividend and get it before 31st march uh, one big expectation and change uh, was on the concessional tax rate provided for new manufacturing company there was an expectation that the period uh, for setting up the manufacturing facility would be extended by couple of years but uh, instead of couple of years at least one year uh, extension has been given there was also expectation that lot of clarity would be provided on issues which are there under the section uh, like what happens to incidental income if a manufacturing company is earning incidental service income like after sales services or installation whether that is covered under the section or not whether that is allowed or not those kind of clarities were accepted also the fact that if i am going to commence my manufacturing by 31st march 2024 whether in 2122 22 23 22, i can earn trading income or not whether that will jeopardize my deduction or not all those clarities were expected but nothing has come on that so that that is something uh, which was all tax professionals and corporates were hoping for but it has not come along uh, exemption for startup was already there but it had one condition that the startup should be set up by 31st march 22 one year has been extended again i feel your at least couple of year extension should have been given with the kind of startup ecosystem india has developed in recent past and to encourage those people uh, uh, the extension should have been higher but generally we have seen government does extension year on year rather than giving a one time extension uh, one one change on uh, business reorganization so today any company is going under mergers typically what happens there is a lot of time lag between the filing of the merger application and receiving approval of the merger application and also typically if i file say a merger application on 1st january 20, 2022 i would want to make it effective from 1st april 2021 so there is another uh, backfill which generally corporates do so what was happening earlier that while this process was uh, going on there was a tax scrutiny or assessment on the entity which was getting merged that is a predecessor entity and by the time the proceedings are completed that entity did not remain in existence because of the merger order coming through and from a retrospective date so the taxpayers were taking an argument that uh, the the assessment which you have done is invalid because that entity was not existence as on that because of this order and that was upheld by various courts so that was uh, resulting in loss of revenue for the government now government has clarified that if we do an assessment on a pre predecessor entity and something like this merger comes along then it would be deemed that this assessment was done on the successor entity also they have provided enabling provision whereby the users can now file a modified return uh, once the merger order is has come through uh, one of the biggest controversy of recent time was whether education says is allowed as a deduction from your corporate income tax or not. Uh, many corporates have adopted a position that education says is not tax because uh, the tax definition include tax or any surcharges. And this uh, view finds support from Bombay High Court as well as Delhi High Court decisions whereby this view has been upheld and post those decisions many corporates have started adopting that position but there was recently a kolkata tribunal decision which distinguished both the high court decisions and said that no uh, education says is nothing but an additional surcharge and hence it is always have to be construed as a tax and in light of that now a retrospective amendment has come from 2005 6 whereby government has said that tax all, always included any kind of surcharge or cess 
So now it would become important for taxpayers to relook at the tax position which they have adopted in light of this retrospective amendment. Also need to see what will happen to penalty whether if you have claimed this, whether there should be any penalty levied by the department because you have claimed this. In my view, if the position was taken based on the High Court decision, a very good case to argue that no penalty should be levied. And also the fact that it is a retrospective amendment. So there is some bit of impossibility of performance to go back and change my tax return. Uh, one more uh, amendment to overrule the rulings which are there. Section 14A earlier, uh, people were taking an argument does not apply if I do not have any exempt income in a particular year. So there is no question of disallowing any expenses which are incurred to an exempt income. Now that has been overturned. And now they have said that 14A to apply even if there is no exempt income in a particular year. Uh, conversion of interest liability into debentures or other instruments. People were taking a position that it's a constructive payment and hence deduction under section 43B should be allowed as it's a constructive payment. A government has said that you can't apply principles of mercantile basis of accounting while you are dealing with a provision which is on cash payment basis. So if by any reason you are delaying your outflow, then that deduction should not be allowed. And hence this kind of conversions, no deduction would be available under 43B. Uh, section 37, a lot of people were claiming expenditure which were pertaining to any uh, offense or penalty incurred outside India or any illegal expenses which were incurred outside India. Now the law clarifies that always the intention was to not to allow any expenditure which is offense or prohibition or illegal whether in India or outside India. Interesting point here is that the amendment wordings are such that it appears to be a clarificatory amendment hence to apply retrospectively but the provision says that it is applicable from 1st of April 22. So it would be interesting to see how this happens for previous year whether somebody in the department goes back and start disallowing earlier year payment or it will apply prospectively. Uh, one of the most uh, debated or discussed change was on virtual digital asset. Government has brought in a 30% tax on virtual digital assets. Virtual digital assets have been defined very bright, uh, very, very broadly. So it will include a non-fungible token, anything created digitally, anything created using any technology which has a value. So the definition is very wide. So all your cryptocurrencies or any other uh, technological creations which result in creation of a virtual asset would be covered. Uh, the government has been particularly harsh in terms of this provision because they are saying no deduction would be allowed uh, except the cost of acquisition. So say if you brought at 1 lakh and you sold at 2 lakh, only 1 lakh would be allowed. Even if you have carry forward losses or losses in other heads, no set off would be allowed. In order to track this transaction, 1% TDS has been prescribed on the transactions. And even if you gift a, a digital asset to someone, it would be taxable. So here the unintended, unintended effect is that there would be a double taxation. So say, for example, today I gift one lakh worth of crypto to someone who is not a relative, then that person who is receiving that uh, crypto one lakh would have to pay 30% tax on that. And tomorrow, when he sells it at 2 lakh, he will have to pay again tax on 2 lakh. He will not be able to claim that 1 lakh deduction because that is not his cost of acquisition. So to that, to that angle, it would result in double taxation. And again, this move will also impact people who start accepting payments in cryptocurrency as professional fees or any other remuneration because if they receive that professional fees in crypto and when they sell it, they will again not get the cost of deduction. So there would be a double taxation. So probably to discourage those kind of transaction, uh, this has been done. Also, a lot of things I'm reading on social media and otherwise that uh, now cryptocurrency is legal. So it is a settled principle of law. Merely government has a right to tax any income. Even gambling income can be taxed any illegal income can be taxed. Merely if a tax law has been introduced to tax a cryptocurrency, does not talk anything about its legitimacy. 
it is need to be seen what the new paper which is already there in the parliament comes in and that will talk about the legality of cryptocurrencies a lot of tax incentives have been provided for ifsc whereby already they want to encourage this ifsc as a, a global hub for people to set up entities they have given incentives to non resident trading in ifsc exchange on offshore derivatives or over the counter derivatives uh, if you are leasing or selling ship or aircraft those benefits have been given angel tax exemption has been given to cat 1 cat 2 funds aif fund which are regulated by ifc portfolio services if you avail from an ifc that portfolio manager uh, income is not taxable in ifsc uh, on withholding tax uh, like uh, sir had mentioned in the start in his address that lot of uh, people are actually earning income but not but some are not coming under the tax net so one important amendment has come around that is on benefit or perquisite given to business associate so to the there are lot of corporate be it fmcg be it pharma gives lot of incentive and benefits to its dealers business associates and the benefits could be in kind or in cash and what is happening currently the law is there to tax those kind of benefits but it is very difficult to track whether those people who are receiving these benefits are offering that income to tax or not so in order to track that government has now introduced a 10% withholding ta tax which is required to be withheld by the person who is giving those benefit or perquisite to his business associate so that all those people would also start coming under the tax net or at least that income will come start coming under the tax net uh, withholding tax uh, on transfer of immovable property was already there today you and me buy a property we need to deduct 1% tax uh, was already there but there was a slight anomaly because the seller has to offer capital gains tax on the sale consideration or the stamp duty value whichever is higher but tds was there only on the sale consideration so now they have aligned it to say that tds would have to be withheld either on uh, sale consideration or stamp duty valuation whichever is high uh, procedural changes made under section 206 ab which talks about higher withholding tax reduce the period from 2 years to 1 year and some additional exclusions have been provided for uh, individuals and hf uh, this is also one of the important uh, changes today many many contracts which an indian company enters with non resident uh, non resident are not willing to pay taxes in india and they enter into a gross up contract uh, with india indian company an indian company uh, who is conservative may want to pay tax and then uh, fight it out saying that this tax was not payable at all so there was a provision under section 248 whereby the companies were uh, required to file an appeal with uh, commissioner of income tax appeals uh, within 30 days of paying the tax uh, saying that I, this tax is not applicable so there the process was getting stuck at cit level and also the ao was assessing officer was not getting the chance to examine the payments so that provision has been scrapped and a new provision has been introduced whereby now you can after making payment of taxes within 30 days you can make an application with the tax officer itself saying that while i have paid the taxes i think these taxes are not applicable and ao is given a timeline of 6 months within which he has to pass an order and once the order is passed and if you are agreed you can then go to cit appeals uh this change which uh, the finance minister said that we trust the tax payer and we understand that there is lot of information to be given and hence we give time to the tax payer to file an updated tax return but when we went into the fine print this looks like a soft amnesty scheme for the evaders and there is nothing for the honest tax payer because today a uh, major challenge is uh, when somebody is filing a tax return is disclosures if you miss certain disclosures and you want to correct your return this updated tax return provision is not applicable to you. if you want to reduce your income this updated tax return provisions are not applicable to you these are applicable only when you want to increase your income and pay additional tax so you pay additional tax plus interest and on that additional tax and interest you pay additional 25% or 50% depending on the period when you are filing a updated tax return again if anything has been coming under scrutiny and you want to settle it by paying an updated tax return you can't do it because the cases which are under scrutiny are out of it 
so we were brainstorming internally and thinking this will have a very very limited impact as not many people would be actually able to use this scheme which was portrayed as a help to the taxpayer but my personal view is that they should have given some allowance to people who don't want to change the income but at least do a right kind of disclosure because day by day the disclosure under a tax return are increasing multifold and that's where you require this kind of help that some extension of time is required uh, some changes on the litigation management system whereby revenue can hold on to filing of the appeal in same or similar cases uh, 263 did not have power on transfer pricing that power has been now granted and other key amendments were uh, bonus stripping was not applicable to equity shares now it has been made applicable to equity shares uh, bonus stripping and dividend stripping earlier were not applicable to rate or invests or aif units now it has been extended to all the securities and complete revamping of the trust uh, compliance and uh, uh, structure has been done in the budget so with this i end my direct tax proposal and i will pass it on to uh, saket for the indirect tax proposal uh thank you everyone and we can uh, take questions uh, in the end thank you everyone thank you nishit thank you acpc for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak or to discuss the indirect tax budget or to, to discuss the budget proposals so uh, to start with in the in the i'll just uh, share my screen so from indirect tax point of view the budget the whole idea of the budget has been to it's been consistent since the past years uh wherein it's uh, wherein con uh, consistency to the extent that compliance is the focus of the budget wherein we want to have more and more compliances done and compliance and strict compliances to do this for this in this budget also uh, there are few few steps that the government has taken wherein uh, the compliances not only of the taxpayer they want to ensure that the compliances of the uh, vendors and the entire ecosystem is there and how mutual policing can work in that kind of a scenario so that's one that we'll discuss in gst and we'll take up gst then customs and the uh, scz and then the scz law just give me just allow me sir sorry yes uh from uh, gst standpoint yeah first a uh, broad revision of dates most of the dates the way they uh, you know they've extended the dates for uh, 30th september was to be a very important day for all, any taxpayer in gst because all your itc claim would lapse if you have not taken the credit credit the credit notes if you have to issue if you have not issued then that gets lapsed and then uh, outward supplies also amendment would used to get over because my recipient would not intend to take credit so therefore 30th september is very very important they have extended that date to 30th of november it's debatable whether it's 30th of november or the date on which you file the return that is or 20th of october or 20th of december that's debatable in our view it should be 30th of november only still until 30th of november you are entitled to take the credit instead of 20th of october or filing the september return another negatively impacting change is a preponderment of payment of tax for non resident taxable persons people who have who are, are non residents and paying tax like a, like an oidr services or from outside of india or any non resident setting up in india and providing services for them they've reduced the timeline from 20th to 30th because anyway they are not entitled to take credit of it so might as well they should pay tax early on rather than wait till the 20th and last one is un and other organization this was an anomaly they only were given 6 months to file refund claims which is now increased to 2 2 years i was talking about the stringent compliance mechanism if you see uh, gstr1 now if you don't file your gstr1 return you will not be able to file your gstr3b return if you don't file your gstr1 return for the past month then you will not be able to file the gstr1 return for the present month so which means if you don't file the gstr1 return for the last month 
you are not entitled to file GSTR one or GSTR three B return. Consequently, so your you know compliances get stuck, get stuck, and all your and you know and in the few uh, about in the last budget which got implemented few days ago or month ago, they've also come. <coughs> sorry, they've also come about saying that if you don't if 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 the if the if the vendor has not filed the return, it is not visible in GSTR two B. You not anyway be entitled to take credit of it. So therefore, that's how they are trying to make mix the entire ecosystem or have the entire ecosystem in a compliance mode. Not only by you know uh, bringing out law, but bringing out mechanisms so that each one become policing for other. So that's the way they have gone about it. They have also given a legislative sanction to the earlier introduced provision. Wherein in 86B, they mentioned that the government said you can only utilize 99% of the credit, 1% of the credit for certain specific uh, taxpayers. Now that did not have a sanction of law, and it was you know it, it could have been challenged. The government has uh, kind of given a sanction that the 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 the, the law or the GST uh, can the rules can prescribe a restriction utilization of credit. So far so good. That if it only applies for the past, or for only for only very specific kind of cases like the one in eighty six B, but this power is very wide. Tomorrow they can restrict the utilization of credit for anyone else. For example, for any service provider or any manufacturer, they can say you can only use eighty percent of the credit. If those things come up, then certainly it will be a big challenge and the uh, for for the taxpayers and big cash flow impact. But currently it's not so, so it just gives a sanction is what we can say. uh and this is one again aligning that you know uh, if there is uh, or rather withholding of recovery mechanisms or withholding of payment of refunds can now be extended to all the claims earlier it was only export or zero rated claims in in duty in uh, inverted duty structures then the late fees revised for tcs now this is the most crucial slide on gst or i would say the most impacting slide for gst it's taxpayer first one is uh, the interest okay if the taxpayer has to reverse the credit then he is, if because if the supplier is not discharged tax now this law was this was there already always in the law that you couldn't entitle you were not entitled to take credit if your service provider or your supplier do not pay the tax but there was no provision which says you have to reverse the credit that you have taken okay in this provision in this uh, budget they have introduced that provision and not only said they have said you have to pay it with interest now separately in a separate provision they have said in the facilitation measure they have said interest is only applicable when you avail and utilize the credit now there is a uh, dichotomy here if the credit is to be uh, availed and utilized then uh, this may not apply so if the interest is applicable that is if you utilize the credit then interest is applicable otherwise interest is not applicable the question remains suppose you have reversed the credit whether the time limit of 30th november which earlier was september which we spoke about whether that will apply not apply that has to be reviewed and answered okay can and it says it can be reavailed when you know supplier discharges it so then if my, my during my reavailment whether the time limit of 30th november applies which means last financial year If the if the supplier does not pay tax before thirtieth of November, then probably my credit may get denied. So that's the impact. The biggest impactful change that the government has brought about in this is, and they have taken it to the next level. We all know that there were twin criteria apart from various other criteria for at the taxpayers end. Twin criteria, which was uh, which was because of the default of the vendors, the credit could be denied, which was. the vendor did not file gstr1 return okay which and that the and that that uh, is not flowing in my gstr2 b returns or if the vendor one second ah huh? sorry there is some back or the or if the vendor does not uh, or if if so or the vendor does not pay the tax so he doesn't file the return or pay the tax these were the twin criteria now uh, now what they have done is they have added few more criteria in this and they have taken it to a very next level what they have done is suppose if the supplier is a newly registered supplier 
the rules may prescribe that his credit may be restricted okay now just imagine you are dealing with a supplier and the rule has restricted say a month or two months credit then it will impact my credit uh, tax uh, recipient credit eligibility that they have brought about now these are all provisions which gives empowers the government to issue rules in the act they have given the powers to issue rules we we'll have to see rules how they are they are implementing it that's really crucial but the powers are very wide it also says if there is any default in payment of tax for a prescribed continuous period so the vendor defaults in payment of tax for a continuous period your credit will be denied it also says if the out now this is very strange output tax liability as per gstr 1 of the vendor not mine of the vendor exceeds the gstr 3b for the said period so in in his gstr 1 he reports a higher amount of tax 3b he pays lower tax then a customer or a recipient's credit get denied and the next one if uh, if the vendor has availed excess itc okay then is eligible in gstr 2b then also my credit gets denied now if this is really really you know this is really, really and even on the utilization this if he doesn't if he is utilized more than what he is mandated to then my credit get denied now all these compliances are at all the vendors end and if these set of compliances are made effective for all the classes of uh, for everyone then what it would result in as a taxpayer as a recipient of credit i need to ensure that my vendor files his return accurately okay and even if he files return accurately if the gstr to be feels that you know this this credit is debatable and the way they'll implement this is the gstr to be return which probably might get get changed it will reflect all the credits which are not eligible which means until now i was under the impression that even if i i i was uh, at the point or i had the opportunity to uh, i i had the reasons or i had the opportunity to take credit it's my my wish that you know according to me these credits are eligible department may dispute it now what they are saying is gst to be which gets reflected from gst in portal that will be the eligible credit you can't determine your credit yourself we will determine the credit and this is the eligible credit and this will factor all these factors at the vendors end now imagine the nightmare or imagine the challenge that it will result in it will result in a situation where when i don't see a credit from a vendor i reach out to my uh, vendor vendor says look i have done everything and still they have denied you the credit okay what do i do you dispute this amount you dispute because your credit is is, is at stake i dispute this credit and i to safeguard my interest of 30th november i still avail the credit and dispute it then i become a defaulter because i have utilized more credit than what i was eligible to and my customer credit will be denied so they are kind of snowballing it or chaining it the entire ecosystem so that everyone needs to have the you know a uh, system in place and very very accurate compliances conduct should be absolutely beyond this bar so that the ecosystem work, work functions absolutely well and the credit is not lost otherwise your credit will be lost now the result what it would lead to is it will lead to a situation where we'll have two twin disputes one a civil dispute from my vendor side because of his default i am disentitled to take credit and this and for the same amount i'll be disputing with the government if the vendor says so there'll be two fold disputes one with my vendor and one with the government on the on this eligibility of credit now this is a very far reaching effect to my mind in the entire indirect tax proposal this is the most impacting um, uh, effect or the most impacting proposal in the gst law which we should represent that either it will be curtailed to only only and the objective of this is for for the uh, look what used to happen is a lot of uh, fly by night operator used to take registration in some you know some uh, farmer driver etc as name and then they used to issue invoices file gstr1 now we never file gstr 3b returns etc and then by the time people took credits etc they were they were you know they they moved out or they were not approved they were not available and therefore government could not do so to restrict all these things they have done this having but the impact of this is if it's applied if it's applied across across the board the impact is far reaching especially for us in the service sector in an exporting sector when we claim refunds of the input tax credit okay because we are exporting your credits may uh, directly get denied because of these reasons so this you are not eligible to this credit 
as per uh, to be this credit is not eligible and all these factors will reduce our export refunds to a very large extent if it's implemented we'll have to again see let me caveat it we'll have to again see how this gets implemented in the uh, in the rules that that are to follow yeah so this is one highly impacting stuff in the gst proposals few facilitation measures transfer of balance in electronic cash ledger hitherto was allowed between cgst sgst and igst but now it will be allowed even for the uh, for various registration across across india suppose if i have in the, within the same pan i have distinct offices in various states having different registration i can the what is whatever is in the cash ledger i can transfer it there instead of filing a refund question may arise this is in the cgst law what happens in case of sgst because sgst law unless the sgst introduces this in their law in the state laws then this is not applicable maybe one uh, you know way around or work around could be if there is an sgst cash balance you transfer it to cgst or igst because that's allowed in the current law and then maybe from there you transfer it to across india that's the kind of you know work around that can be handled if it's a sgst cash balance the next is interest i've already spoken it's availed and utilized and they've made it retrospectively maybe for the past period if someone has paid 24% interest on wrongful availment and utilization of credit or on availment of credit probably they can claim a refund of it uh it may be if the, if refund is claimed it may be good that you know if it's within the time bar or within two years period if it's not within two years period then this may be litigated to my my personal opinion you still can be uh, allowed a refund because it's an it's a it's it's the interest that you have paid excess which they are entitled to uh, so there should be a limitation of two years may not apply but this uh, can only be given granted by the high courts that's my personal view so that may be there if if there is any excess payment apart from that they have done uh they have made they have all the redundant changes of you know matching of two way communication which the which the in the gst law that was envisaged when 2017 when it was introduced but they realized that gst and or the systems are not capable enough to do this at that point in time they have they had postponed it to undefinite time now probably they have understood that this is never going to happen so they they have deleted in this law right uh then due date of filing refund claim in relation to scz uh is again from the date of filing tribu be return it's more of a clarificatory amendment rather than a substantive one anyway it was you know kind of this is what something that that was being implemented far reaching effect now this is a special slide which i thought may be relevant for our kind of an audience where is you know service exporters uh, so i have included here few things G gst appellate tribunal few misses in the budget has not been uh, introduced it's been 55 months or it's been 4 years more than 4 years that the gst law has been announced is there but we don't have the gst appellate tribunal what it is resulting in a lot of our clients are facing the brunt is exporters we have exported department at ground level many a times most of the times they rejected on some flimsy ground or the other okay even in genuine cases they have rejected the refund i filed appeal appeal also rejected at commissioner appeals then what do i do there is no gst appellate tribunal my refund gets stuck until this this gets resolved only option available to me is to file a writ now that is you know for lot of exporters especially service exporter this is being a big problem especially in state where the jurisdiction is state because for state level authorities and services can be complex services can be very very complex for various state authorities they are used to handling goods you know physically movement of goods etc for intangibles or services they are not used to so they may you know reject the refunds denying this to be an export for various reasons and the one reason is can be even third bullet that i have mentioned on intermediary this is also a very debatable point what comes to be an intermediary is a question uh, last circular also issued a few times uh, about in september where in they said intermediary they have clarified thankfully for the outsourcing industry or bpo services that what that their bpo services will not qualify as an intermediary because that was one aspect that was being getting rejected because saying stating that these are you know uh, these are not this does not qualify to be an inter to export service because it's an intermediary so that is uh, clarified however there are other services services such as 
you know, uh, marketing support or any other service wherein you are doing some or some not an outsource, but then you are doing some promotion activity. But that may not qualify. Whether it qualifies to be intermediary or not is a debatable point. Tribunals, ARs have been issued on this point, but it's not concluded. You know, it's still a very gray area, and that's that becoming a breeding ground for litigation, especially for exports where exports are being denied. And similarly, you have the appellate tribunal. There are contradictory rulings coming up, and these rulings are you know creating more confusion. The certainty that it was supposed to give is is being lost uh, because of these different rulings. Last point for exporters that was announced in April 2018, where is e-wallet scheme, wherein enough to prevent cash outflow. What was announced is that you get certain amount. The Ministry of Commerce gives certain credits uh, in the wallet, which can be used for payment of import duties when you import certain goods, and then when we export, this gets replenished. This e-wallet system could have been a very uh, great boost, especially now. when you know when we are you know when the uh, tourism and several sector of service sector are getting impacted adversely this could have been a good uh, mechanism for boosting uh, services and service exports but unfortunately this is uh, you know this is not this is missed out in the budget they should have introduced something on these lines in the you know implementing uh, provisions in the gst law but this is not there maybe in the gst council it should be taken up in fact one point was there whether what should we be representing i think this is one point as a service exporters we should represent that this be implemented it was announced in 2004 years back it should be implemented now this is the best appropriate time because of the pandemic this the industry is now you know coming out of it 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 will need some sort of impetus to grow this can be you know represented i'll not take maybe customs if there are any questions i'll take but broadly two two things i know uh, in looking at the time maybe i'll just uh, quickly glance through the customs uh, one is legislative change on proper officers dri customs authorities the supreme court in canon india nagarwal metal said that you don't have the jurisdiction and dri looks at more of the uh, smuggling kind of or fraud kind of a cases all these cases were getting scot free government retrospectively amended the law to say that they have the powers to negate these judgments and to so that these you know these uh, fraudsters do not uh, get scot free that was one amendment that they have done retrospectively however this is the first time that i have seen the government has actually accepted the judgment uh, and for future periods the government has said that you may investigate cases but the adjudication or the show cause notice would be issued by the proper officer or the jurisdictional officer so the government in one breath have accepted this judgment but so that that uh, the fraudsters or the you know the investigators do not get scot free government has brought out a retrospective amendment one big one important change that they have done in the uh, advance ruling mechanism is they have said that it will in customs fortunately not in gst or unfortunately not in gst fortunately that will depend on which side of advance ruling you are in but from customs it will have a shelf life of 3 years it is yet to be seen what happens after 3 years the certainty is only for 3 years after 3 years should you file another advance ruling should you take your position because the government doesn't want to be bound in uh, time till eternity on any advance ruling that has been given by some uh, by the advance ruling authority so they have provided a shelf life of 3 years period we'll have to see whether in other laws like gst or income tax whether they bring out this shelf life or not and uh, for customs valuation for importing of goods government the cbic is being power to have additional obligation to check undervaluation which means the red tape is up or it may have an impact when you have to clear the goods because you may have to you know this will not be good for ease of doing business it may impact the you know flexibility or it may impact the uh, quickness or speed at which the goods gets cleared yeah then there is concessional end use based exemption for goods will not apply so i'll just run it through government trust has been making india an atmanirbhar bharat and they have been given impetus to manufacturing in india and thereby increasing basic custom duty for a lot of products uh, so that we have manufactured or including capital goods so that we manufacture these capital goods also in india and reduced basic custom duty on several raw materials etc so that we have uh, so that we can use it for our uh, uh, you know at a lower rate so that our cost of manufacturing gets reduced and they have also given impetus to textile leather industry etc by giving them a boost you know uh, they can be end use based exemption 
so that they can use this end use based exemption they can procure duty free and then you know if they are exporting and i was just discussing before the session with the uh, with the with the with the scpc governance team i think something of this sort should be there for services also that is one thing that we should represent at least for you know mr talati was mentioning that in in the last uh, proposal also they have mentioned this i think this is something which we should push for that for services also impetus may be given especially because of the pandemic lot of services like tourism are you know are are down under the ground yeah then project import also they have said phase me uh, basis it will increase which means you have to uh, import uh, importing would be costly for capital goods and for uh, white goods you have to import you have to manufacture in india last a minute on special economic zones while nishid has covered a lot of it probably they have encouraged by their relationship or their marriage with the state government the central government have uh, encouraged because it's been more than 4 years that the marriage is going well and the state and center are working towards you know uh, one nation one tax probably for scz also only if the center gives them the relief state does not give the relief it was not getting that much of an it was not becoming that much of an impact so therefore they are what they are trying to do is they'll have a sweeping reform reform for development of enterprise and services hubs for scz laws and scz law will be revamped with state with partnership with state we'll have to see how this gets you know implemented from a custom standpoint for scz uh, they are now having an automated facilities risk based checks will be there on that is on exceptional basis and automated functions in the national portal will be introduced uh, from 30th september is what was announced by the honorable finance minister we'll have to you know probably so that's something which which in 7 8 months we'll we'll see the, uh, how it gets implemented i think uh, last point not on the tax proposals something relating to service sectors ayushman bharat is what was announced in the budget proposals where it, an open platform will be rolled out for digital registration of health service provider health facilities uh, and unique health identity consent frameworks etc we'll see how we'll have to see details of it how it gets implemented and how it is making ease in you know in the uh, healthcare sector then even tele mental health program will be introduced 23 tele uh, mental health centers for excellence will be rolled out for health counts for mental health counseling for tourism i don't know to what extent it helps in tourism but national ropeways development program will happen on ppp mode uh, which will improve connectivity and convenience a loan guarantee scheme was announced in 28 june 2021 looking at because of the covid for tourism industry uh, to give you know credit uh, <laughs> facilities to them let's see how it gets implemented for education sector a digital university will be established to access students across india so that you know quality education can be provided across the country even the rural areas with personal personalized uh, learning experience at the doorstep that's the objective i think thank you for uh, from my side in terms of these were the budget proposals that i wanted to discuss happy to take any questions or any any, any question that was uh, sent out earlier also happy to take those questions now thank you so much uh, mr nasir tan mr saket tan there are definitely lots of question what we'll do is we'll just open it just one point i wanted to understand uh, you mentioned about uh, consistent tax rate and uh, for foreign dividend uh, from april 1st onward just uh, you know i'm not an expert on the subject so uh, don't mind if it sounds so kiddish but uh, you see mode 3 export in services where indian companies can establish uh, you know uh, their uh, permanent offices in some country and from there like how that uh, this particular aspect is going to impact mode 3 export so you are talking about the concessional rate on dividend right yeah so it was in fact it's a, a, a negative change whereby earlier it is not going to import exports what is going to impact is dividend so okay. say for example an indian company hmm. has a subsidiary in us in hmm. china in hong kong hmm. and they are making money outside india and they have accumulated reserves hmm. that reserves can be distributed as dividend to the indian company okay in okay. order to promote indian corporates to bring that foreign exchange back into india mm-hmm. 15% rate was prescribed on mm-hmm. dividend now mm-hmm. that has been withdrawn 
So now if your company is liable to tax at 25% instead of that 15, from 1st April 2022, you would be paying 25% instead of that 15%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So will it have a positive impact on getting the Forex to the country? So positive impact only for one month if people think that this window is going and I get it back. Okay. After that, it would have a negative impact because then people may not prefer. Exactly. That they are already habituated to huh. that 15% rate. Yeah. Anyway, uh, like what I'll do is like I'll ask people to raise their hands and uh, they can introduce themselves and ask the questions from the experts. Anyone? The floor is open for everyone to ask questions. So I think so. There are two, three questions in the chat box. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm just opening up. If you can uh, see that and if you can answer the ones which are relevant. Sure. Yeah. The first question is COVID related tax exemptions are there <coughs> on April 2020 or in the new year. Hmm. So the COVID related tax exemptions are from financial year 1920, hmm. it's applicable from assessment year 2021. So it is applicable from financial year 1920 itself. Mm -hmm. Then second question is in the definition of virtual digital assets, yes. are, are they, they covering software unintentionally? Mm -hmm. No, what they are trying to create is any asset which is created out of uh, digital uh, using any information or code or token uh, and which is generated through cryptographic means or otherwise. So while there could be very, very little overlap, but in general, software will not get covered in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, third one is on uh, uh, indirect tax, uh, Saket. Okay. It's probably not a question, but a comment. It says ITC regime is set up for perennial disputes. Yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. it's a comment rather than a... I agree. I would agree with it unless and until we see rules restricting it, like the 86B rule had restricted the mechanism to a very large extent. Unless we see rules restricting it, currently the, the powers that is given for rules from the act is very, very wide and certainly it will result in, you know, most of disputes in GST, this is probably a breeding ground for litigation across the board that will happen in GST regime. Okay. There's one more question which has just popped up. Is the delayed payment of uh, EPF will lead to disallowance of expenditure that is paid before filing the tax return by an SSC. No, so you have to pay it within the dates of the EPF. This was the amendment which had come last year. And there were decisions which, uh, which were there earlier to support the position of uh, allowance basis, the payment before the due date. So that controversy continues. But last year they had specifically made an amendment or last to last year to restrict it to the date which are prescribed under the statute rather than filing of return. There is a question on mutual fund, whether it comes under digital asset. No, no. So mutual fund uh, clearly does not come because it has underlying mm. uh, security and units of a mutual fund are separately defined. So mm -hmm. nothing to worry. Continue our SIPs. One is uh, regarding tax on dividends of 25%. Does it impact the double taxation avoidance agreement that India has with many countries? Again, on the same. So a uh, double taxation avoidance agreement hmm. is to look at the taxation in the source country or the foreign country. It never, okay. DTAA does not talk about tax rates in a home country. Hmm. So say for example, I am an Indian company having a subsidiary in Singapore. Oh. And I am receiving dividend from that Singapore company. So the okay. double tax avoidance agreement will govern the rate which is applicable to me as an Indian company on the dividend oh. in Singapore and not in India. Okay. And whatever I pay in Singapore, any which way is available as a credit against okay. this 15% or now the new rate 25%, which is oh. payable in India. So it will not impact the short answer is the DTAA obligations. Okay. Anyone uh, uh, else thinking to get the answers to the question can raise their hand. Yeah, I think there is one question relating to indirect tax wherein uh, yeah. Madhusudan has mentioned. 
uh, as regards input tax rate, there are several judgments that SEC cannot be done at ITC for any reason. How do the current budget provisions be viewed? Are they not ultra virus the constitutional right of the SSC? Provided credit? Yes, this is also what this would be also probably in my mind would be a litigating issue. In the past, uh, in the you know in the earlier regime, pre GST regime, there are various judgments of Supreme Court where they said credit is an indefensible right. Okay, mm -hmm. so once you are entitled to take credit, your credit cannot be denied. And there were you know that has that has been since there since then this has been uh, uh, accepted across. However, there are also Supreme Court judgments which says the it is a it's a benefit given to you. And the government, it's not your right in that sense. So one is, once you get it, then it's an indefensible right. Whether you're entitled to or not, that is the government government's hand. Okay. Now, in those cases, if you if you just those are and if you look at those kind of cases wherein the government has said that, you know, just because this there are certain restrictions mentioned doesn't mean that you know you're entitled. For example, today also. You're not entitled to a lot of services, say a rent a cab, you're not entitled to take credit of it. They've decided this entitled you. Now, what the government's side would be, look, what we have done, we have disentitled you this credit because of his default. If you recall in the past regime, in the VAT regime, this 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 was never done in the central tax regime, it was always there in some of the VAT laws, where for non-payment of tax at the vendor's end or the supplier's end, your credit was denied. Now, those cases went to high courts. Bombay High Court ruled against the taxpayers. I think Delhi High Court and Calcutta High, Delhi High Court ruled in favor of the taxpayer. Both these matters went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court dismissed the other side's appeal. So in that sense, today, if you see whether eligibility of credit can be restricted because of non-filing, non-payment of tax by the vendor, that was anyway there, that was anyway there in the law, which was challenged, is still pending in the, in the, in the High Courts and the Supreme Court. The judgments which has already come out uh, for the past regime are, you know, are, you know, both are balanced, both high, both the high courts and both the Supreme Courts are balanced. Both have taken, you know, rejected both the appeals. So both stands corrected or both stands there. Okay. In the Supreme Court, in the GST regime, few DY detail and few more judgments that has come about wherein the, they have not exactly dealt with the issue. They have given benefit to the taxpayers stating that you first catch hold of, catch hold of the vendors. Or the suppliers who are defaulting parties, but have not so clearly laid down the law that it is that it will be that it will be allowed. So therefore, certainly this is a this is anyway part of the litigation. This will only enhance, increase the litigation by way of a right of constitutionality, etc. To my personal opinion, as I was mentioning, they can restrict what is eligible to you, and if they restrict what is eligible to you, probably they may not be wrong. And we have already seen in the past. Even if the Supreme Court decided, even in the in this budget, government brings about out with a retrospective amendment to correct that. So that so therefore this looks. I am not trying to build a scary picture, but yes, currently this can be the case. Best would be if the government restricts it to a very very specific cases where there are frauds or takes it uh, all together. That would be the best case scenario. Otherwise, we are uh, the stage is set for litigation. Thank you. I I don't think there are any other questions. Papa, any question from your end? Alpa, are you there? I don't think so. Anyway, like, uh, you know, just to well, briefly summarize it, so many inputs you gave. And I do understand that, uh, you know, I'm not coming from this field. So a lot of things, of course, I also need to understand. But if I look at the export uh, from the export perspective, definitely like uh, the tourism sector, even the education sector, where we thought that there could be something more than what has been just mentioned in the budget. One of our uh, demand was there. In fact, we requested for setting up that international arbitration center that has been taken into account. And, uh, but besides that, you know, incentives, of course, like last year, we had some allocation on uh, manufacturing on ABIS or not tech. Such kind of thing is not there this time on services, in fact, especially, which the industry actually wanted to revive, survive. And, uh, you know, most of the sectors are uh, quite hit. 
and e passports i i did had uh, you know one interaction with our travel and tourism uh, uh, industry representatives they didn't seem to be too much enthused with that e passport okay because technically it is just not going to help them generate business so from that perspective anyway like uh, what we can do is we can carry on with our discussion in due course of time and uh, we have requested our industry representative and those who are participating if they have the expectations of course expectations will always be more than what you are given by the government but still justified expectation which can uh, bring in uh, a lot of benefits to the industry can be written back to us we are sending the rejoinders to the government representing various sectors so that can be one in fact this particular interaction was also aimed at that to create awareness to understand those gaps and uh, you know i must thank uh, mr saketa and mr nishan to put everything in perspective and uh, i think like uh, acpc needs to carry on with both of you uh, your organization to take it further to different level and make a kind of you know regular feature and uh, so again like uh, uh, you know it's uh, uh, like i would express my gratefulness for you to devote your time thank you and thank you alpa for organizing this and the entire team uh, for making it possible this is the first budget interaction we are having uh, this time you know and i think we can continue with uh, two three more in uh, next few days itself okay so let's plan and go ahead thank you so much in fact our vice chairman could not join he had some uh, pressing preoccupation but he also sent the regards to the experts uh, chairman got busy with some meeting so thanks to him as well for uh, devoting his time thank you everyone thank you sir and thanks all the participants to be here with us thank you so thank much you. thank you thanks. so much bye